Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to day four of Regex for Dummies. So let's start off by answering our quiz questions from the previous day. When validating email addresses, why is it better to use the range 2, 4 to match the extension .com, .org, .etc., rather than using the more simple plus symbol? Uh, the answer is because here we can specify that the extension can either be two letters, three letters, or four letters. On the other hand, if we use the plus symbol, it could be uh, any number of letters. So you might want to do that for some instances, but if you need to be as specific as possible, set a specific range. There, that way, if the extension is five characters, you'll know that it's not a proper extension. How would I match a block of text that is a minimum of five characters and a maximum of ten? Okay, let's go back into our little program. And we want a minimum of five and a maximum of ten of any character. So we could do something like uh, period and then we want 5 comma 10. And I'm going to turn off global, turn off ignore case and get rid of all this text and let's see what it matches. So let's just type some letters. Okay, so you see it did not match at four letters but as soon as I typed the fifth letter it did match. And if I keep typing you'll see that it starts to stop matching, but it still found a match. So if we're, if this is a long word, something like that, it'll still return true. So we need to wrap it within um, backslash b, and that matches the word boundary. So now it will only match the entire word rather than parts of a word. And you'll see now it matches. Okay. All right, go on back. Whoops. Number three, how do we turn the question mark symbol from greedy to lazy? Uh, we do that by adding a second question mark. So if I go back, instead of doing a P or something like that, you could do one more to turn it into the lazy format. Okay, we're going to work with JavaScript today doing a replacing methods. So I'm going to close this out. Close that out as well, and let's create a new document, and I'll just call it replace.html. I'm going to edit this with Notepad, and I'm going to paste in just some uh, beginning tags, and let's start by just creating a simple input. So let's do a label for, and we're going to give our input an ID of name. Okay, so we'll just type name. And we'll do input type equals text, name equals name, and I'm also going to give it an ID of name as well. All right, so if we view this in Firefox, pretty much what you'd expect, right? We've done it many times. So this is a sample run, assuming maybe you're allowing your user to create an account and you want to make sure that their username doesn't contain any symbols that you don't want. Or this could even be used for uh, protection against SQL injection or things like that. So we'll begin by doing it the jQuery way and then I'm just going to show you how to do it with uh, raw JavaScript if you're not using the framework. So let's import jQuery and get started script type equals text slash JavaScript. So we're going to get the input with an ID of name. So we're grabbing this input by its name. And we're going to get its value. So we can get that by doing VAL. And then if you remember from the other day, to replace, we're going to do whatever that text is, dot replace. And then we're going to replace, we're going to search for a regular expression. And then whatever is matched, we're going to replace that string with whatever we want. So the first one, let's just do regular expression and then replace it and I want to replace it with nothing and that way we'll strip out any symbols or slashes or semicolons and things like that. So for this example I'm just going to say anything we don't want to allow the user to type anything that isn't a letter or a number so we can do that I'm not sure if I've showed you this in a previous lesson when outside of the caret uh, I'm sorry, when outside of a character class, the caret represents uh, the beginning of a string. But if we have it in here, it's actually saying not. 
So when we type it at the beginning, we're saying replace anything that is not slash w, meaning anything that is not a letter or a number, and we're going to replace it with nothing, designated by this empty quote here. But we need to make sure that we assign this to a variable. So we'll just say var name equals that. And then if we want, we'll do alert name. All right, run this in Firefox. And I'm going to type Jeff. And I hit the blur, and it's not working. Let's come on back. Oh, of course, I'm sorry. I forgot to attach the blur event. So we can say get the element with an ID of name dot blur is function. Sorry about that. And then we can go, and since we've already attached uh, name, we can just replace that with this. So get this input element, and when it blurs, meaning when the user uh, moves focus, they focus away, uh, we create a variable called name, and we get whatever value is in that text box, and we replace anything that's not a letter or a number with nothing, and then we show an alert box. Come back to Firefox, refresh the page, type my name. We blurred, and it alerts us with the name. So let's see if the regular expression is working. I'm going to add just a bunch of arbitrary uh, symbols. Hit tab, and you see it removed all of those. So we can even put it within. So we can do... Okay, tab off. And it did add the ending. So how can we fix that? Why did it remove the symbols at the beginning, as you can see with Jeffrey, but it didn't remove the symbols at the end? Why don't you take a look at this and see if you can figure that out. Okay, did you do it? We matched the first occurrence of a non-symbol one or more of those characters. So if I come back, it matched the and, the carrot, the dollar, and the pound. But then it went back to a letter, so that was the first match. So think back, how can we tell the engine to continue matching? Don't just match the first occurrence, match every occurrence. Can you remember that? Well, we, we add G to the bottom, to the very end, and that means global. So now, whoop, let's close that out, refresh the page, and let's do it again. So click on it, tab off, and now it's taken care of all of that. So this is kind of a nice feature, especially when you're working with a database where you can protect yourself and you can just strip out any of those uh, using the client side. You don't want to rely on that 100%, but it's a nice little feature. Okay, so we took care of the jQuery method. But what if you're not using framework and you just want to use regular JavaScript? So let's get that and stream it. And let's do another one. So we'll do um, document.get element by ID, and we're going to get that same input box, and we're going to get the value. I'm sorry, no. Uh, we're going to set on blur, and then that's going to be equal to a function. So we'll just say um, do something. And then let's create our function, function do something. And we'll say um, name, var name is going to be equal to uh, this dot value dot replace and then we're going to do the same thing so if I want I can just grab that since we've already written it paste it in and then finally alert name so we're getting the element with an ID of name and on the on blur event, we're going to call the do something function, and do something function will grab this is referring to the, the element, and we're going to grab its value, so whatever is typed into that text box, and then we're going to once again call that replace method. So let's try it again. Type Jeff. And we get one error. This dot value is undefined. So let's quickly go back. It's probably just a small mistake. Document dot get element by ID dot on blur equals do something. Yeah, we don't need those um, 
we don't need those. So we can just get rid of that, come back, and let's try it again. Refresh the page, type my name, and now it alerts my name. Let's try it once again with the symbols. And with raw JavaScript, we have the same effect. So feel free to do whichever method you want. Just remember, if you are doing it with JavaScript and you're going to be working with, with events, you need to make sure that you compensate for both of the browsers, which is probably beyond the scope of this tutorial. But, um, you know, just to sum it up, if you, if, if you have your function and you want to grab something about the event, whether it's the type or the screen position of the mouse or whether a key is clicked, uh, you know, with jQuery, you can just pass in the event object, which is how, which is how it works in Firefox and Opera. But Internet Explorer, of course, is a little bit different. You know what? I'll just go ahead and show you. This is the end of the regular expression portion. So if that's all you want to watch, feel free to stop. But if you'd like to learn a little bit about uh, the event object with uh, the different browsers and raw JavaScript, feel free to keep watching. So let's do this. Let's create a new file. Save it, and I'm going to save it as uh, event testing.html. And let's get rid of this script and this one right here. So we'll say we're going to change that to on click. And I'm going to change the function we're going to call to do something. We'll start with IE, in IE. All right, so function do something in IE. Okay, so what are the differences with the event? I can't believe I'm doing this right now. It has nothing to do with the tutorial. Uh, what are the differences between uh, the way the event object is called in IE as compared to Firefox? Windows, it, Windows uses, uh, it's attached to the window object, so you would access it like uh, window.event. Now, on the other hand, Firefox actually accepts the event object as a parameter. So in Firefox, you would just literally pass it through like so. So if we were working, let's say we want to get the coordinates of where the mouse was clicked. Let's create a variable called um, xc for x coordinate. And that's going to be equal to window.event. Remember, the event is attached to the window object in Internet Explorer, and I believe that even includes IE8. So window.event.screen x. And let's do an alert, xc. Save that, run it in the browser. I'm going to listen for when I click. So I click. Yeah, let's go back. Document.get element by ID. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have a new project. We don't even need this input. So let's get rid of those. And no, we don't want to attach this to the element. Let's just attach it to the document. Come back, refresh the page, and now if I click, we're going to get one error, window.event is undefined. Now, that is because we're viewing this in Firefox. So let's copy that, and now I'm going to um, run in IE, and let's click. Okay, and we get an alert, and 393 contains the X coordinate in pixels of where we clicked. So if I click over here, it's going to be higher. Over here, it's going to be lower. So that worked in IE, but it did not work in Firefox. So let's do another one for Firefox. Do something in Firefox. Copy that. Comment it out. Paste it in. And do something in Firefox. Now, Firefox... Uh, you can pass in the event object as a parameter. So we could do evt. And then we would do var, var xc equals evt.screen x, you know, pretty much the same way. So let's come back to Firefox this time, close that out, refresh the page, click on it, and now we get our alert. But if we go back to Firefox, refresh the page, click on it, we get this error on the page, click on it, and screen X is null or not an object, and that's because it can't access that EVT property. So we have to find a way to combine the two to check to see, does this EVT parameter exist? If it does, we know we can use that. Otherwise, we need to assume that uh, we're in IE and the event is going to be attached to the window object. So once again, copy that, and this time it's gonna be do something in all. 
All right, and we'll create a new function. Ah, forget that. Do something in all. So this is pretty much how you'll see it done by most people. Let's pass in the parameter. And then we're going to check to see if that parameter, if it does exist. So we'll say um, var e equals evt. Let me go ahead and finish this up. rxc equals e dot screen x alert x. Okay, so let's just see if this works first, and then I'll come back and explain it to you. Get one error. XC is not defined. Come on back. Should be capital. Save it. Back. Refresh. Click. We get our alert. Works great. And come into IE. Refresh the page. Click on it. And it's working in both. So why is it working? We're using the ternary operator. operator and we're basically doing it like Firefox would would allow. We pass in the parameter and then we assign it to a new variable called E. And we're saying EVT, this is the ternary operator, does EVT exist? If it does, E will be equal to EVT. Otherwise, E is going to be equal to window.event. So to clarify, we're saying if EVT exists, we know that we can pass it in as a parameter. So we are just once again, assigning E to EVT, all right? On the other hand, if it does not exist, we assume, okay, the user must be using Internet Explorer, in which case we need to assign E to Internet Explorer's method for uh, finding the event object, which is when it's attached to the window, all right? So we just check, and then we, as always, we use E.ScreenX. So sometimes E will refer to the event parameter that's passed in, and in other browsers, it'll refer to the window.event object. It's all the same. It's just a matter of how you access it. Okay, so we went far off, but uh, the reason I went into this is because I had someone email me about this very thing a couple days ago, and it gave me a little bit of trouble when first getting started too. So might as well throw it in there somewhere. Hopefully it helps. If not, you could have stopped a long time ago. See you guys later with day five. Bye-bye.